the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. Together, reducing fraud worldwide. I think it's important for fraud examiners to understand as much as they can about human beings. Because when you get down to it, people commit fraud. And so you are trying to find a person. When you're developing internal controls or processes, you are doing that to prevent people from doing something that they're not supposed to be doing. So the, the longer I've, I've done this and, and the more uh, fraudsters that I've talked to and in interviews that I've looked at, I thought, you know, we really need to, to take a step back and look at the end. These are the people we're trying to catch. These are the people we're trying to protect from themselves. What are they thinking? What's going through their mind? Uh, the people, at least that I have met, they're good people. They come from good families. They had good jobs. And so why one day did they decide, hey, here's some money. I think I can take it. I think I can get away with it. What, was, what were they thinking? And so if you can understand, the more you can understand about their motivations and their justifications in their own mind, I think the better it is to catch them and the better it is to, to, to know what they were thinking and how they did it and how to prevent it. One of the things that's really interesting to me in the fraudsters that I've interviewed and then even going back and looking at a lot of the, the fraudsters that uh, Joe Wells and Jim Ratley have interviewed over the years is almost universally the people that we talked to that committed fraud against their organizations told us that there, was, there were no policies and procedures in place there was no ethics training. There was no fraud awareness training. The, most of them said yes. They usually would have some kind of code of ethics, but they didn't even weren't sure where it was. Um, I had an individual tell me that the only time he'd ever heard of fraud awareness training was when he was in prison. And so. All of these all, all these fraudsters said one of the common themes in their organization was that no one cared about ethics. It was all about the bottom line and how much money we can make, and they really were not concerned with any type of, well, how do we make this money? So often they were ripping off the, the public. At the same time, the fraudster was ripping off the organization, and a lot of them said their justification was, well, if they're not going to follow the rules and they're not going to play by the rules, why should I? So they're making, I'm helping them through, you know, some of my frauds to get millions of dollars in stock options and bonuses, so why shouldn't I get some for myself? Often, I think, when we're, we're designing controls or we're doing plans and policies that we leave the human element out of it. And you're just looking at the concept of, well, um, we need two authorizations to request a, a payment and pay it. So that's a control. It's in place. That's fine. Well, uh, I mentioned Nathan Mueller before in his company, they had a great, that was exactly what they had. You had to, one person could request a payment, the other person had to go in and approve the payment. But here's the problem, and when you step back and look at this, it, it didn't work very well because if one of those people was gone, the other person couldn't approve a payment. And so they were friends, they knew each other, they trusted each other, so what did they do? They gave each other their passwords. So you have to always stop and think. It's like no matter what you come up with, will people follow it? They're human beings. Their natural tendency is to take the path of least resistance. 